Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this IDF Forum. I'm Kathy Antela, Vice President of Education at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, and will be your MC tonight. So, of course, whether this is your first forum or your 100th forum, we are honored to have you join us tonight. And we are looking forward to receiving some outstanding information about COVID-19. We can never get enough information about that. And as always, the disclaimer, it is important to note that the information presented during this event is not medical advice, nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment please always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified healthcare provider with questions concerning a medical condition. Well, IDF has been a leader in the PI community for over 40 years, and everything we do is based on IDF's mission, which is to improve the diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life of people affected by primary immunodeficiency through fostering a community empowered by advocacy, education, and research. And in addition to that, we have a variable vision for the next five years, which is that IDF seeks to ensure that everyone in the US affected by PI has a fully informed understanding of the PI diagnosis that affects them, all available treatment options, the expected standard of care, and all of the opportunities for connection and support within the PI community. Now, questions whether you are an individual with PI, a family member, a friend, or a healthcare provider, IDF is here to help. When you have questions about living with PI, health insurance, or more, simply go to the IDF website, click on Ask IDF and submit your question, and a staff member will follow up with you. Support, let's talk about support. You know, living with a rare disease can be challenging or having a family member with a rare disease can be challenging. If you're looking for support, there are some wonderful options. And one of them is IDF Get Connected groups. These groups are exclusively for individuals with PI and family members, and they are held virtually nationwide throughout the year, and they are a great way to meet others and receive support in a small group setting. Now, another option, if, you're, if you would prefer one-to-one -one support, send a message through Ask IDF and ask to be networked with one of our wonderful peer support volunteers and you will get that one-to-one -one support. Education, education is key. It is so important, it's part of the mission statement for IDF, but also being educated when you're, you're living with a rare disease, you can't learn enough. I have heard hundreds and hundreds of presentations about immune system basics, and I learn something every single time. So education is important, and speaking of education, our next forum is coming up. February 9th, and it is a SCID Compass Lunch and Learn, and the topic is three years of screening for SCID in North Carolina. Then on February 17th, the next forum is like this, is going to be Understanding Immunological Testing. So we look forward to having you join us for both of those events. So you know to find our events, take a look at our IDF event section on the calendar on our website, um, but there is a reminder 
please remember before you try to register for an event to sign into your my account and then go to the IDF event page and register for the event. That way then you will be sure to get that follow-up email saying, thank you for registering. And of course, as always, if you have questions, just ask us. We are happy to help you. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our two presenters. First of all, we have Dr. Manish Butte from the University of California in Los Angeles. And we have Kathleen Sullivan, who is from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and she's a member of our Medical Advisory Committee. So both of you cannot thank you enough for joining us tonight and turning it over to you. And Dr. Sullivan, I think you are um, pulling up your slides first, correct? Yes, I will. Um, let me know if it's in the wrong view. So I'm the first of two speakers. I'm super excited to present with Manish. We are both what you might call technology geeks. I hope Manish is okay with that. We love um, we we love technology, um, but we also kind of found ourselves, like some other immunologists, becoming COVID experts. And so we've divided our talks into two big sections. I'm gonna cover virus and vaccines and testing. Um, it's actually not the sexiest part of the talk. So Manish gets to do the really cool stuff. He's gonna talk about Ebuchel, Paxlovid, um, so Truvimab, and he'll talk a little bit about immunoglobulin as well. And so we really have divided this into distinct categories and I'm just gonna get the ball rolling just by making sure everyone kind of has the same landscape and everyone understands um, the basics and then Manish will take it away. So I, um, this, I'll, I'll try and be quick, but also really clear. I know there's a lot of confusion. So let's start with the virus itself. Um, so the name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2 and the illness is COVID-19. It's not super important, but if you hear both terms, it's kind of nice to know that one is the name of the virus. Now, as we've all learned, this is a member of the coronavirus family. You've probably seen pictures or you remember early in the pandemic, the virus kind of looks like a little crown, hence coronavirus. And one thing to remember, because variants are a big part of the discussion, this class of viruses, this species is very prone to mutation. And it's because of their, their chromosomes, essentially. They're just not the most stable. Now, the way viruses kind of persist in the community is that they are fitter than the previous ones, or there's some kind of drift in the community. Now, in the case of the pandemic, each major strain has been succeeded by a strain that is fitter, and fitter can mean a bunch of things. It can mean more transmissible, it can mean more resistant to the immune system. That fitter means a range of things but it means it's a more successful virus. So the virus has mutated multiple times. At the beginning, that was alpha strain. <clears throat> then you remember there was delta strain, which caused a huge surge in the fall. And then just as we were all feeling optimistic, Omicron hit and Omicron was super transmissible. So delta and Omicron were fitter than the alpha strain. And so they took over in the population. So. Where are we right now? So Omicron is the dominant strain right now. There is a substrain of Omicron called BA.2. You might have seen this in the newspapers. It's part of the Omicron strain, but it has 20 additional mutations. It's dominating in Denmark. It seems to be getting a little bit of a toehold in certain geographic regions in the US. It doesn't seem very different. It might be a smidge more transmissible. So there's a study out of the United Kingdom that came out just yesterday that suggests it's a bit more transmissible, but it's equally defended by antibody, which is important when we talk about vaccines and everything that Manish is gonna talk about, the BA.2 does not seem to be any different than Omicron. So of course, now we're all super sensitized to variants, <clears throat> you know, are they different? Do they cause more disease? 
BA.2 doesn't seem like a big difference from Omicron, so nothing to worry about. And Omicron is fitter because it's hugely more transmissible. So what does that mean? Each cough generates more virus. Each cell that's infected produces more virus. So what does this mean on a person level? On a person level, what we're seeing is that the age is getting younger and younger. So the, the symptomatic ages with Delta were younger than the symptomatic ages with Alpha. The symptomatic ages with Omicron are younger than the symptomatic ages with Delta. And as a pediatrician, I certainly care about that. We're seeing more infected children and more sick children with Omicron. Although overall it is generally less severe than Delta, just because there's a huge number of people now that are infected. We have more kids in the hospital, more infected kids. It's a big deal for schools. If you have school age kids, you don't need me to tell you, it's a big deal and it's a political hot potato. So <clears throat> because people have been worried about strains, I just wanted to show this graph. So I'm gonna use my pointer, which I think you can see. So the green strains here back in the spring of 2021, so about a year ago, this was the um, alpha strain. You can see it was supplanted by these purple strains, which are all Delta. The different gradations of purple means that there's a mutation or two, but they're all Delta. They're all under the Delta umbrella. And then this red clump right here is the rise of Omicron. So you can see Delta, oops, sorry. Delta was much fitter than alpha, so it took over quite quickly. And then Omicron was fitter than alpha in the pop, fitter than Delta in the population, so it really dominates right now. And everywhere that Omicron has taken a toehold, it's become the dominant strain. So this is just the natural history of RNA viruses, coronaviruses. It's, it's not unique, it's not um, anything peculiar. Often I'm asked, well, what's the next variant? You never know. So the mutations happen randomly and it's just if you get a combination that makes that virus fitter, then it can spread to the next person more easily. So what this means is that there can be more variants down the road. We shouldn't feel like, oh, let's just take a deep breath and we get through Omicron and it'll all be okay. There could be more variants, but we are getting super close to having not perfect, but pretty good herd immunity. And so there is at least some hope. I don't want to predict the future. There's some hope that after Omicron, enough people, at least in the US, will have been effect infected that it's going to be harder for each next strain to get a toehold. No one ever wants to predict the future with COVID-19. Um, but there is at least a body of people who believe that Omicron represents kind of the beginning of the end. Not that it will go away altogether, but it will just percolate at low levels in the community. And because Omicron is less severe, that's a good thing. So this is from, um, you can go on this website, it's called Next Strain. I just wanna make the point that what we're seeing in the US is not the same as around the world. So while in the US, we think a combination of vaccines and natural infection may lead to something like herd immunity, not exactly, but something like herd immunity. That's not really true in other parts of the country where Omicron hasn't gotten a toehold. In Australia, for example, which has been in the news quite a bit, they locked down their borders. So they really didn't have an alpha outbreak. They didn't have a Delta outbreak. So they have no natural infection in the community. So they have a very different landscape of viruses, similarly in China, where they've been very locked down. So the spread of the virus around the world is not equal. And why is this important? Well, you probably remember that Omicron, we think, not for sure, but we think arose in Southern Africa. It could happen in another country that the next strain arises. But again, if there's at least some community immunity to SARS-CoV-2, even if it's imperfect, each subsequent wave in theory ought to be less. Again, I don't wanna predict the future, but this is kind of the prevailing idea from infectious disease people. So there is, there's hope. I wanna leave you with that. So I'm gonna tackle some of the questions. So Kathy talked about the fact that Colleen had been collecting questions and both Manish and I are gonna try and tackle some of these questions. 
I'm just going to call them out and um, answer them. I then have a little bit more uh, in the way of slides and information, but related to the virus itself, is it possible to have more than one variant at a time? In the entire world, yes. You saw the map that I just showed you. Sure, there can be multiple variants circulating, particularly in different parts of the world, but even in a single country. In a single person, not impossible, but very unlikely to have different COVID strains at the same time. Question number two, if I had COVID before Omicron, maybe you had the Delta variant that infected a large swath of the population. If I had COVID before Omicron, can I still get Omicron? Yep, definitely. So even without having an immune deficiency, definitely. There are lots of folks out there getting Omicron after having had Delta. So not, um, not really in question at all. But the level of symptoms depends a great deal on your antibody level, whether it's from the vaccine, whether it's from the previous infection, whether it's from one of the agents that Manish is gonna talk about. Your antibody level dictates to a certain extent, not perfectly, but largely how sick you're going to get. More antibody, less sick. So while people are getting breakthrough infections with Omicron after natural Delta infection, or even after vaccination, they're typically not very severe. People have a scratchy throat, a stuffy nose, and that's the end of it. Whereas remember way back with the alpha outbreak, people were super sick. So this is definitely an improvement even if people are getting breakthrough infections. So there's another point that I wanna make that I have a slide on later on. There's this balance between the level of antibody that you have and how many viruses enter your body. So in a mouse, which is how we test a lot of these things, if you have fabulous antibody levels, you can overcome it by injecting a bucket of antibody. These antibodies act by binding up the virus. And so if you overwhelm that by having so, so many viruses, the mice will still get sick. We think the same thing happens in people. So the intensity of exposure is a big variable that we sometimes neglect. So coming back to the question, if I had COVID before Omicron, can I still get Omicron? Yep, you absolutely can. We think it's likely to be milder, but there are some other variables, including the intensity of the infection, the number of viruses that you're exposed to. So this brings me to another few slides. I wanna make the point that natural infection, yep, you get antibody out, it's just not as much as with the vaccine. These are super powerful vaccines and I'm gonna talk about the PI community in a minute. These are super powerful vaccines. That's why people get uh, some side effects. So, but they induce a lot of antibodies. So if you look at the, we'll just pick the, um, the graph on the right with the red dots. This is the amount of antibody that you get after natural infection. In the middle, you have the amount of antibody after a single vaccine, just one kind of makes sense. One vaccine equals one infection. When you give a boost, you have about 20 times more. So this is a log axis. So here we're at about 100 and here we're at 500 to 1000. So dramatically more antibody with two doses of vaccine. I'll talk about boosts in a minute. So yeah, you do get antibody after natural infection. And I hear so many people say, ah, I don't need the vaccine. I had COVID back in the spring it's probably worn off. Those antibodies are probably not as high now as they were in the spring and you didn't get that much to start with. So um, yeah, good on you. You got infected. Yes, hopefully not severe and you have some antibody, but don't count on it to last a long time and don't count on it to be as strong as the level of antibody that you get with the vaccine. So let me turn my attention to long COVID. This came up in clinic today. I get asked about it nearly every clinic. So long COVID means symptoms over four weeks. Not all long COVID is the same thing, but we're still figuring out what long COVID is. There are some risk factors. So women get long COVID more than men. If there's early lung involvement. So most people with serious lung disease get sick like a week into the infection, but folks who get early lung involvement, day three, day four, they're more likely to have long COVID. Obesity, 
poor general health. So there are some risk factors, but here is what came out just this week. So there's a beautiful study to come out of Seattle where they just threw all manner of technology and said, we're gonna spend a million dollars. We're gonna try and figure out what long COVID is. Really, it's, a, it's an impressive study. I really love it. What they showed is for the people that have long-term lung involvement, so they're struggling to get over the cough, shortness of breath, that part, they have more reactivation of a virus called Epstein-Barr virus. This is the virus that causes mono. They have more antibodies to type one interferon, which we know is a risk factor for severe disease. And they have more autoantibodies. So things like antibodies to your red cells, antibodies to your cells in general. That's quite different than long GI COVID. It's a really different thing. So in the long GI COVID group, nothing to do with EBV, nothing to do with antibodies to interferon. It's all about these T cells that are living in the gut. And long GI COVID, it's pretty miserable for people. Then there's brain. Those folks have altered markers of circadian rhythm. And then the fatigue correlated with this mono reactivation, which kind of makes sense. So long COVID, <clears throat> excuse me, long COVID, I think some people have kind of, you know, plunked with chronic fatigue and said, oh, it's a big giant mystery. But there's some real science now to look at what the causes are and importantly, what the mechanisms are, which is key for two reasons. One, we do not know yet if people with PI are at risk for long COVID, just don't know. There is a survey that's going on now. If you've had COVID, please ask your doctor con to contribute. So USIDNet, which is a partnership with IDF, is collecting data on acute COVID, <clears throat> excuse me, COVID vaccine responses, COVID vaccine side effects, and long COVID in the PI community. So please contribute, or ask, it, it has to be entered by your physician. Please ask your doctor to contribute your data if you've had COVID, if you've had the vaccine, be a part of this and make us all smarter. But this is what we know for now. So I think it's important to the PI community because we're trying to understand if PI is a risk factor and because fatigue is a really big part of long COVID. There are probably many people on this webinar and certainly many of my patients with common variable and no COVID have fatigue. We don't understand it. I think gaining insight to the fatigue of COVID-19 and developing a treatment might, might pay off for the general CVID community. I think there's a lot of money, a lot of energy being put into the study of long COVID compared to the study of CVID. So I'm hopeful that we will learn something that we can apply to the general CVID population without COVID who have fatigue. And I know many patients are looking forward to that. So let me turn my attention to vaccines for the last few minutes. How many, which ones, how do I space them? A lot of confusing. I'm gonna tackle spacing first. I get at least one question a week on this. Do I need to space the vaccine in terms of my immunoglobulin? If I get my IVIG at the first of the month, do I need to wait and get my vaccine at the end of the month? If I'm on Hyzentra or some subcutaneous form, do I need to figure out spacing? In a word, no. Um, now that could change as the level of antibodies in the immunoglobulin products get higher, but for the moment, there's no reason to think that Having, having more or less immunoglobulin on board is gonna interfere with vaccine responses. So um, there's, there's not a compelling reason to try and space your vaccine in terms of your immunoglobulin administration, whichever type it is. How far apart should the vaccines be and how many should I have? So the mRNA vaccines are super easy. So it's a two dose primary series, roughly a month apart, slight difference between Pfizer and Moderna. If you have an immune deficiency, you should get a third dose and that third dose counts as part of the primary series. The CDC recommends it for moderately to severely immune compromised people. It's 28 days after the primary series. So um, time zero at one month and at two months, that would be three doses. That would be the primary series for people with PI. What is moderately to severe compromised immune system? There's no definition. If you want that extra dose, you should get it. 
just go ahead and get it. So I'm sometimes asked, is it IgA deficiency? Is it hypogam? Is it CGD? There's no definition. I say, if you want it, go and get it. There's no regulation. That is different than the booster dose, which counts as the fourth dose for people with PI. So the booster dose is five months after the primary series. Only the Pfizer vaccine is approved um, for kids over 12 as a booster. You can get the Pfizer for five years and up as a primary series. And good news, if you have young children at home, we think it will be approved for kids six months and older in March. So good news there. Um, the Moderna vaccine is 18 years and older. So you might have to mix and match and that's totally fine. Don't ever worry about, should I do this one first? And this one just mix and match and do the ones that you can. Now, the story is different if you started with the J&J &J vaccine. So the J&J &J vaccine is a single booster. Um, the mRNA vaccines are preferred as a booster over the original J&J, &J, but you can do whatever you want, but the mRNAs are said to be preferred. They are not suggesting a third dose for people with PI. It's kind of unclear why that is, but they're not. So that's the landscape for the vaccines. In general, unless you got the J&J &J vaccine, which not many people did, if you started with the mRNA vaccines and you have PI, my personal suggestion is four of them. You can do as you please. So how many vaccines should I have? Four vaccines for moderately to severely immunodeficient people, J and J2. This is a common question. It actually showed up in the chat box already. I didn't make antibodies. Well, let me start with the question that was in the chat. I don't make antibodies to pneumococcus or tetanus or diphtheria. Why should I get the COVID vaccine? And the answer is this is just a better vaccine. So people who don't make antibodies to anything else make antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so with these mRNA vaccines, not so much the J&J &J vaccine, but with the mRNA vaccines, it's such a strong vaccine. So if you have CVID, for example, it's worth getting the vaccine. 80% of CVID patients will make antibodies after an mRNA vaccine. Now, let me tackle the question that is here. I didn't make antibodies after three COVID vaccines. Should I take a fourth? Uh, up to you. I, I would say if you didn't make antibodies after three, you're probably not going to make them after four. But um, certainly, I, I'm not going to say no if people want to. What I will take this moment to point out that did come up in the chat box already is that antibody testing is terrible. It's just terrible. I mean, two years into the pandemic, why is it that we don't know what a protective level of antibody is? And why do we have 18 different companies measuring it 18 different ways? It's, it's insane, but I can't change that. That's just the reality of it. So the antibody testing is terrible. It's not standardized. And so you might get an antibody level out of one company that says, no, not present, not protective. And it might come from another company and it says protective. It's just because there's no standardization. So I wouldn't put too much weight on antibody levels that you're getting through commercial testing because they're not standardized. And in fact, we don't know what protective is. So if you want a fourth vaccine and you haven't responded to the first three, I personally would never say no. You should ask your own immunologist. I personally would never say no, but I'm pretty pessimistic that you're gonna get much out of it. And then the last question is, is this gonna be an annual vaccine? Nobody really knows. Um, we think that it is likely to become an endemic infection, which means it kind of circulates at a low level in the population. And because so far the antibody levels are waning in kind of the six to nine month time frame, I think there's a good chance that it will become an annual vaccine, but that's me speculating, that's not etched in stone. Now, I'm just gonna finish up with what about people with antibody deficiencies? Again, maybe you didn't make good antibodies to tetanus or pneumococcus. Maybe you're on immunoglobulin replacement. My opinion is you should still get the vaccine. So let me make the point about natural infection versus vaccine. So this is from a nice paper that I um, am citing at the top and you can see antibody deficient. So let's just look at nucleocapsid here in the bottom left. So the antibody deficient people with one exception make levels of antibody that are comparable to the normal population. So again, even if you've got CVID, there's a good chance you're gonna to respond to this antibody. 
Now, if you compare vaccine responses in immune deficient patients to here they're using healthcare workers. This is a nice study out of the NIH. Um, the first part is the level of antibody that you get after natural infection. This is the only patient who seemed to have a natural infection. So let's look at the anti-spike, which is down here in the bottom. So pre-vaccination, everybody's kind of in the gray zone, not really much antibody. After one dose, oops, I lost my arrow. Up, after one dose, they're up here. And after two doses, they're up here. Notice that one person who's a healthcare worker didn't make much antibody. They made a little bit after their first vaccine, not very much more after their second vaccine. So there are people in the general population who don't make great responses to the vaccine. But here is why I'm showing this particular figure. This is a mixed population of immune deficient patients. This is their pre-vaccine levels. This is the person right here who had natural infection. And now after dose one, you can see that the range of antibody is pretty comparable to that in the healthcare workers. There's a couple folks down here who didn't respond at all. And there's a couple folks up here who responded fabulously. If you look at dose number two, you can see again, most immune deficient patients did great with the booster. They made nice levels of antibody, but there are a couple folks who just down here at the bottom just couldn't do it. And that has generally been the observation in people with inborn errors of immunity or PI. Who are the folks who don't respond? This is from the same paper I just showed you. And it is, it is um, boys and men with XLA. So most of the folks with antibody deficiency, which I'm guessing is most of the people on this webinar, most of the people with antibody deficiency responded just fine. That's over here on the left. The one, um, sorry, I think it's two that did not. These are patients with XLA. You might have another diagnosis. I don't want to exclude other diagnoses. Here we have STAT3, which is hyper IgE syndrome. Again, one lone person who didn't respond, but the majority of the patients did respond. APESED, which is a candida susceptibility illness. Again, mostly responded. Other, this is um, immune regulation diseases, which is kind of autoimmunity and immune deficiency, mostly responded, and then kind of a mishmash of others over here. So generally speaking, immune deficient patients, even those with antibody deficiency, respond fine to the virus. And then this is the first paper to come out. And um, I love this paper because you can sort of see the individual diagnoses and it makes the point about um, natural infection again. So here we've got pre-vaccination antibody levels in pink. This kind of maroon color that looks like three separate clumps are the people with PI. I'll come back to that in a minute. If you look at the patients, uh, sorry, patients, if you look at the general population after a vaccine, and this is the Pfizer vaccine, they're in yellow. So you can see it's a huge jump from this pink group to this yellow group. And the folks that got the vaccine have much higher antibodies than the folks that were convalescent from natural infection. Those are the folks in green. So let's come back to these um, PI patients here. So there's a little clump down here that just didn't respond to the vaccine. Then there are two clumps here. This middle clump is roughly equivalent to convalescent antibody levels, which is not great, but protective for some number of months. And then a whole bunch of people who responded normally. So what are the diagnoses? So the folks who didn't respond at all, XLA, two patients with common variable, a patient who got rituximab, which depletes B cells, the antibody producing cells, one patient with ALPS and one patient with a combined immune deficiency. But look, the majority of patients with different types of antibody deficiencies or complement deficiencies responded to the vaccine. So in my opinion, again, definitely worth getting. So I've talked about antibody like it's, oh my God, the best thing on the planet. And here's why. I talked about this idea that um, you have to, ha there's this tension between number of viruses and amount of antibody. And antibody um, protects against infection but when the inoculum size is huge, when it's a huge, overwhelming number of viruses, the antibodies just can't keep up. So think of them like a sponge. The sponge can only absorb so much, and then you overwhelm it, and it can't absorb anymore. That's kind of the concept with this. So the antibody is largely protective. 
Some people have breakthrough infections, but most people with reasonable antibody levels to SARS-CoV-2 aren't going to the hospital, aren't being, aren't getting super sick. So the antibodies are protective, but maybe a few little viruses are sneaking through and causing a low level infection. So antibodies are indeed all that really important. But I just wanna end with some patients who don't even make antibody might get benefit from the vaccine. So why would that be? So when we are infected naturally with a virus, we make antibodies and we develop memory T cells. So even men with XLA who aren't gonna make a whit of antibody to the vaccine, they are gonna make memory T cells. So, sorry, let me finish my thought there. So these memory T cells, they're not like the sponges that prevent the virus from getting in, but they do mean that you should, that they should mitigate the severity of infection. And there's a paper that just came out today that suggests in the general population, previous exposure to other coronaviruses, which generated memory T cells, are somewhat protective against severe infection. So even when I think the person isn't gonna make great antibody, I do usually still recommend the vaccine because I think they may get the memory T cell component. So let me just finish up with a few questions that people had sent in. Um, immunoglobulin, I'm on immunoglobulin. Does it affect my test result? It does not affect the rapid antigen or the PCR testing that's done for acute COVID. So you don't have to worry about that. But there are antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 in the commercial immunoglobulin product. So whether you're on IV or sub-Q, there are antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. Remember that antibody comes from plasma that people donate. People have gotten the vaccine, people have been infected. So there are antibodies that have appeared in the product. We just don't know if it's a protective level yet. My personal experience, I have a number of patients who have gotten infected. So it's clearly not totally protective, but it may be partially protective. So second question, will IVIG protect me? It does have antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. Not entirely clear how protective it is, but that level will go up over time. So as more plasma enters into the production line that has antibodies, the level of protection will go up. Will my sub-Q product protect me? Also has antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. We just don't know exactly how protective it is. So I'm gonna end there and turn it over to Manish. That's a tough act to follow. Okay, you covered so much ground. Um, thank you. And um, I hope everyone knows Kate is the reason that I went into immunology and, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> I owe it all to you. Okay, so let me see if I can get my slides up here. And okay, so as Kate said, I'm going to talk about the second half of that uh, outline and try to get into um, the monoclonals uh, like, that, like that we're using for treatment and for prevention. Uh, antivirals and how they work for treatment, and then um, protective antibodies. Uh, I'll touch a little bit on what Kate just talked about, which is about how our Ig replacement will hopefully over time contain some protective levels. So let's turn on the slides here and jump in. Um, I've been trying to answer questions on the Q and A, uh, typing as fast as I can, and for every question I answer, three more appear. So I'm I'm worried about whether I should answer any more. But I'm going to close that window here and jump in. Okay, so. Um, as Kate mentioned, everyone's familiar with the, this virus and its spikes that, that are decorate the outside of the, um, and the reason I'm going to show this picture um, at the risk of, of something that you all know a lot about is so that you can understand how the monoclonals work and how those other um, uh, antivirals work, uh, because it will help you understand um, their role in protection, prevention, and also in treatment. So one interesting about this particular virus, unlike most of the other respiratory viruses that we uh, know and hate, like metanumovirus, like influenza, like RSV, is that the surface area infected in the lung by COVID in particular is seems to be much more than other respiratory viruses. It covers a lot of that surface area. So instead of a small area of bronchopneumonia that you might get from a bacterial pneumonia or a viral pneumonia, uh, instead you get a larger surface area. And it seems to compromise then, <coughs> well, some of the oxygen, I'm getting, getting hypoxic here, uh, a little oxygenation. And so when oxygen levels dip inside the, those alveoli, other parts of the lungs open up to respond. Our lungs have this built-in capacity to sort of keep parts ventilated and perfused, even if some parts are, are full of mucus and infection. 
But if a large surface area gets compromised and, and, and hypoxia occurs, um, it can also drive the, um, the blood vessels to start uh, promoting clots. And so we know that clotting is a major consequence of coronavirus infection, probably because of the large amount of hypoxia that's in the lungs. Okay, why, why am I mentioning the surface area of the lungs? Because this virus spreads throughout the lungs through binding to a molecule called ACE2. ACE2 is found in our bodies and especially in the lungs. And ACE2 is the, is the part of our lungs cells that the virus attaches onto and uses to enter into our cells. So I'm gonna zoom in now on ACE2 and the virus to show you how that works. So this is a lung cell of yours and mine, and this is the virus itself. This is not to scale, this is a cartoon. But as the viral spike, remember those orange spikes that I showed you in that picture, as they, as they bind onto um, the lung cells, what they're actually binding to is ACE2. So ACE2 is, is the receptor for the virus. And there are other proteins on these uh, lung cells that help turn on the virus spike protein and allow it to then infect the cells. Um, so the binding here of the viral spike to ACE2 is the first step. And it's a step that we would love to be able to block. And I'm gonna show you how the antibodies do that. But once the um, spike binds, it turns on this fusion uh, mode where the, the spike itself sticks out sort of like a like some sort of transformer toy and attaches into your lungs cells and then fuses the virus with your own lung cell. So it brings them together and, and, and fuses in. Uh, at that point, it, it secretes into your cells the viral RNAs and these little um, blue and uh, which are nucleocapsid protein and red, which is the RNAs. They're being injected now into the lung cells. At that point, the RNA has been injected. The virus has infected your cell. Okay, so that spike domain itself pops open. Uh, and I, you know, I think many of you know, like keys back in the day had that little um, fob where you, if you press the button, the little key pops out. And then imagine, you know, if this is complicated, this is the metaphor that I want you to keep in mind. That little key part that sticks out is the part that goes into your dashboard, that goes into your ACE2. And um, if you could block the fob from opening, like by breaking that little, that little button here, or, or duct tape it closed in some way so that the fob can't open up all the way, the key doesn't actually open up, then, then you won't be able to get it into these two and it won't be able to infect your lung cells, okay? So this is the idea behind our monoclonal antibodies is that they'll stick to parts of this key, like, like putting a little, some tape over it or, um, or keep it from opening up all the way so that it doesn't actually get into infect your cells. And, and zooming in now uh, further, now seeing these molecules, this is what the spike protein looks like. Now the spike is on the bottom and the ACE2 is on the top. And anything then you can insert in here that keeps the ACE2 from binding to the spike, you will be able to block the, the infection. Uh, and that includes uh, many different molecules that are being developed as treatments and, and preventatives for COVID, in particular monoclonal antibodies. So this is the way those monoclonal antibodies work. All the ones that we've uh, used for the last uh, two years and the new ones that are still available and available to fight Omicron, um, they all work the same way. These antibodies stick right here, right where I'm pointing to, and they prevent the spike from attaching to these two so that it can't be injected into the cell. Okay, so that's how the monoclonals work. What monoclonals am I talking about? Um, in the beginning of COVID, we were using this pair of monoclonals uh, that were from Lilly. Uh, and as Delta came out, these became very ineffective against the mutations in Delta. Uh, what does that mean? That means Delta had some mutations in this part here, in this part here, in this part here, where the monoclonal couldn't stick to. So imagine you're trying to put duct tape, you know, around the key here, and the duct tape just wouldn't stick. Like, you know, when it, when you're, when it gets wet, you know, tape doesn't stick well when it gets wet, right? So imagine you're trying to put like a piece of scotch tape around this part of the key here, and it just keeps falling off. That's kind of what Delta's spike did to the original antibodies. They tried to stick and they would just fall off. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, and then the, the key could open and it infect the ACE2. So the Lilly monoclonals would not block the spike protein of Delta from going into the ACE2. So we took them, we stopped using them last April. Uh, Regeneron's monoclonals still stuck. So that the tape was a little stronger, you know, you can buy stronger tape and it, it stuck. Even though Delta was different enough from the original virus, the Regeneron monoclonals still worked, uh, but they stopped working with Omicron. And so we stopped using Regeneron's monoclonals. They're actually no longer, neither of these are, are approved FDA approved medicines anymore because they just don't work against the strains that we're seeing. 
So what we do have are other monoclonals. Um, this monoclonal called Evershell, which is a pair of antibodies, just like this pair of antibodies. And actually there's a pair of antibodies in here too. There's a pair of antibodies in Evershell, Evershell. And, uh, and these are their names. They're totally unpronounceable groups of syllables of, of consonants and vowels that, that some mad genius invented. And, uh, and, but we call it Evershell just to make it easier for, on us. This is a pair of antibodies and it does stick to the FOB and it does keep it from binding to the ACE2. And this monoclonal, it's a single monoclonal, it's not a double, it's not a pair, and it's called citrovimab, and it also sticks really well to the Omicron FOB, and so it keeps it from binding to these two. And we use these right now based on what these companies, Glaxo and uh, AstraZeneca, uh, they ran clinical trials last year in 2011, and they, um, they were targeting Delta in those trials, the big wave of Delta last summer. These, these drugs were run um, in studies at that time, and they were like amazing for Delta. And we're lucky that they work for Omicron. Um, and and they, they sought, these companies sought of the FDA approval saying, we would like to use our sotrovimab to treat infection. So when someone comes with COVID and they're very, very sick and they're in the hospital, um, we would like to treat with sotrovimab, just like these guys did. These were used for treatment um, back in the day. Uh, these guys at AstraZeneca said, well, you know, the treatment thing seems to be very well covered. Look at this. This one works well for Delta. And I, we hear about this other stuff that Glaxo is working on and that works for Delta and there's, there's other companies too. Uh, we're going to build this around prevention. And so the trial that they ran last summer, they actually ran a treatment trial as well, but they ran a prevention trial. They asked, can we prevent COVID? If we give people Evershield ahead of time and then they get infected, and we blow some COVID in their uh, SARS-CoV-2, they, will they not get infected? And that was their goal of their clinical trial. And it was very successful. And it's one of the reasons why then the FDA said, okay, you can use it to prevent infection, and you can use it to treat infection. But it's important, if in case you care, these are very similar things. They work the same way. Again, they just bind onto that thing and they keep it from sticking in the thing. And, and so these are not fundamentally different from each other. It's just the way that the trials were run and the indication that was sought by the FDA that really makes them for treatment or for prevention. Okay, so Evershield is a little different than just a monoclonal antibody. It is a very special monoclonal antibody that, um, that was modified, genetically mutated before it was built. Now, just to be clear, these antibodies are not the same kinds of antibodies that you get in your Ig infusions. They don't come from people. These monoclonals, Evusheld and, and Sotrovimab, they um, are made in a facility. They're made with cells that have been engineered to pump out antibodies, and then they scoop up that antibodies um, from the solution that the cells are growing in, and they filter it, and they purify it, and they put it into little jars, and they, and they ship it. These are made in factories. Um, these are not coming from people. And it gives uh, the scientists who are developing these monoclonals a chance to modify the genes of these antibodies so that they have special properties. And uh, Evershield is one of the, um, the special technologies that was made by AstraZeneca that they're calling their YTE technology. It's just some mutations that they've made in the antibody itself that allows the antibody to last a long time in the blood. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Antibodies, the kinds that you can get like citrovimab, the, the lily ones, the, uh, the, the Regeneron ones, the ones you get in your immunoglobulin replacement, all those IgGs have a half-life of about three weeks to four weeks. And that means if we inject some into my blood today, that amount that I injected today will be about half gone in about a month and then a half further in another month and a half further in another month. Um, and that's because these proteins themselves get recycled. You know, there are parts of your body that'll say, oh, look at this, this thing is floating in the blood. We don't really, you know, I can, I could use some of these amino acids. I'm going to reuse these parts. We do that. We're constantly refreshing our blood with new antibodies and filtering out old antibodies from our blood. Uh, it's a continuous process and it gives a half-life for antibodies. And that process uh, for all of our IgGs lasts for about three to four weeks. Uh, this one is different. These antibodies in AstraZeneca have been modified. Three amino acids here have been changed. And those amino acids change the recycling. So even though there's a, a molecule on a cell saying, I'll recycle this, I'll recycle that. Look at this protein in the blood. I can make use of some of that. Um, that recycling in a, is unable to grab onto these antibodies as well, which means they, la and that the recycling process is called FCRN. And, and that recycling process uh, being defect, being uh, disabled means that these antibodies last longer in the blood. Uh, they last three times longer. So the half-life of Evershell antibodies is about 90 days. 
uh, not 21 to 28 days, like in any other IgG. Uh, that means um, three months. And that means uh, it lasts in your blood at a high level for three months, going down by half, and then three more months for another half and three more, which means practically speaking, six to nine months is the um, effective amount of time uh, that, that we're told that Evershell will be protective in the blood. Uh, that is incredibly good. That means one injection might last you all the way through summer. Uh, and, and that's what we're very hopeful for. Okay. So what is the data that, what are the data that supports uh, Evershell's uh, use? Uh, it is um, a study, as I mentioned, that was uh, run last summer to prevent COVID not to treat. And uh, patients, 5,000 patients were randomized. Some got placebo and some got Ibushel. And, um, and all these patients, for the most part, 75% of them, had some kind of comorbidities, obesity, diabetes, cancer, pulmonary disease, lung disease, liver disease, and immunosuppressive and or immunocompromising conditions, including organ transplants on immunosuppressive medicines, rheumatology patients who were on uh, rituximab and other medicines, uh, and, and immunodeficiency patients. It's important to know that the minority of patients who got tested, the small minority of patients who got tested in this study were actually primary immunodeficiency patients or patients with immunosuppressive meds. Um, nonetheless, we still can learn from those patients because they showed a big benefit and that's what uh, was used to get the FDA approval. Okay, so these patients uh, had, were treated and this is what the, the data looked like in the end after um, uh, six months or something like that, or uh, 90 days, I forgot exactly what the duration. Oh yeah, it's 180 days, uh, six months. Um, eight patients who got Evershield of the 3000 patients, eight of them got COVID. And, um, and of the 1700 patients who got placebo injections, 17 of them got COVID. Uh, and given these numbers and the percentages, this comes out, if you do the math, to an almost 80% reduction in COVID. And this was a big win. This means that we can prevent COVID. By the way, um, the Regeneron antibodies went through a similar preventative study, not for immunodeficiency patients, but just with household contacts, and also saw about an 80% reduction in COVID back in the original and the Delta strains of virus. The Regeneron antibodies can't be used anymore. But it, this result is very similar to that result, which means that if you can give good protective antibodies to people, even before they get COVID, it will probably prevent about 80% of COVID. That's a huge win for us. It's not 100%, nothing's 100% in this world. But this is a huge win for us because uh, especially for patients who can't make great antibody responses to the vaccine, this is the antibody response that, that, you've, been, that you've been waiting for. Um, and this is sort of what the graph looks like. And I think this is an, uh, one of these kind of stunning results that really helps people say, yes, this should get approved. So this got approved uh, sometime, sometime at the end of December, around December 20th or so. The side effects for Evershield were considered roughly the same as placebo. There are no special warnings for Evershield um, use in our patients. For example, headache, fatigue, and cough, the top three ones um, noted in at least 3% of the patients uh, were roughly the same percentages seen in patients who got placebo. Now, uh, there were um, some cardiovascular events that were, may not be related causally to receiving uh, Evershield. For example, some of these occurred months and months and months after getting Evershield. That these cardiovascular events, even if they occur four months later, they still have to be noted down on, a, on an event sheet and that gets submitted to the FDA and it shows up on this kind of table, uh, even if we don't think that they're directly related to giving the other We don't know. We don't know what the circumstance was. There's 5,000 patients in this trial and, and we don't get to know everything about every one of them. But there were more patients, slightly more patients who got um, cardiac events, including uh, myocardial ischemia in patients who might've had pre-existing coronary artery disease. Uh, heart failure might have been increased in some of these patients. Um, as you know, many patients in that study, uh, because of this population, already had some degree of heart failure, already had some degree of cardiovascular disease, et cetera. So these are the numbers. These numbers are higher in percentage-wise in this column than in this column. Uh, they're not overwhelming, and they were not enough for any for the FDA to say this is a special warning. Don't take Evershield if you have a cardiac disease. That is that does not appear anywhere on the label. Uh, but it is something that if you are concerned about, if you have serious coronary artery disease, if you're already in heart failure, et cetera, 
you know, it might be something you want to discuss. Make sure that your cardiologist is aware you're getting this medicine. Um, make sure that they monitor you appropriately. Each person in the end has, is their own case, right? Their own custom case of immunodeficiencies and heart diseases and diabetes and obesity and age. And you have to sort of piece together, um, you know, the best safety strategy you can. Um, you know, it's impossible for me to say for each of you whether this is uh, enough to say no, uh, but, but this is enough to say, really think about saying yes to getting Evisheld. Okay, uh, the supply of Evisheld is horrible, okay? It is just horrible. And this is, this is so frustrating for us because we have this thing now that works and it prevents COVID and here we can't even give it out, okay? So I copied and pasted this from, uh, from, the, uh, FD, uh, from the government website. The government is buying up Evisheld from AstraZeneca and providing it to each state and each state's providing it to each county. In California, each county is sending it to each of the major health systems in order to try to distribute it. In California, we have a rule that it has to be distributed equitably, which means every single dose has to be tracked for who gets it, where, what the socioeconomic index is, um, if people self-report race, uh, ethnicity, and gender, uh, those are also tracked and, and reported back to the FDA on a weekly basis, uh, sorry, to the state of California on a weekly basis. Um, and, and so we at UCLA had to build a, a big infrastructure around collecting every single dose and tracking this information, getting it back to, to the county and to the state uh, every week. Uh, we've built that infrastructure. We had got our first 220 doses about two weeks ago. Those have been given out. We got our next 300 doses last week. Those are being teed up, including our first primary immune deficiency patient this Thursday. Uh, today, sorry, at noon, he told me he might join this call uh, if he's if he's around. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're it's starting to roll out to PID patients. At UCLA, we also have to give other tier one patients include, including heart transplant, organ transplant. You know, we do 400 kidney transplants a year here. So we have a lot of patients who are in tier one highly immunocompromised patients who got immunosuppressive medications who have cancer, got rituximab, they didn't run B cells. And so all of them, including the PID patients, fall into tier one. And so we are making our way through the list. Uh, we heard today uh, at 10 o'clock this morning that we're now looking at a substantial increase in doses uh, on the order of a thousand. And so we are very, very interested now in getting this out to our PID patients. For those of you on the call who are in the UCLA area, you're gonna hear from Alexis and me in the next 24 hours. And we're gonna start bringing you into clinic. Uh, we're gonna use our, my clinic as a, a distribution site um, starting next week. So we're gonna really try to get uh, these doses rolled out as fast as we can. We're now, as of today, limited by places and people to give the dose, not the doses themselves. That, that is changing so fast in all of your states. Uh, check in with your doctor again. This week's answer will be different from last week's answer. It is for me. And so it really is a good chance for you. But you can see here, um, these are the number of doses that have been given out as of um, as of this morning. I downloaded this yesterday or at this point. And, um, and you can see the number of doses is incredibly low. A, a California state of you know, 40 million people, we got 8,000 doses of Evasheld, um, you know, Connecticut. These are, these are crazy low numbers. This is what the availability has been. Uh, we're seeing this ramping up, but it is, um, it is still low. So not, not everybody's gonna be able to get the, the, this medicine all up front, but please, uh, as I said, every week now, um, you know, bother your immunologist and say, uh, do you have any Evasheld for me? Um, and, and even for those of you who go to a distant um, re referral center, sometimes your local county may have a dose available for you through one of their like health clinics that might be easier to get than the big you know, mothership academic center, which has to process all their kidney transplant patients. So think about all kinds of strategies you can use. Um, we, we heard of a couple of our patients getting it by such strategy this week. Uh, so try everything. The, the other column here is for citrovimab. Remember, citrovimab is the monoclonal that's used for treatment for COVID. And um, it is also extraordinarily limited in supply. In general, we've been receiving at UCLA about 30 doses every few days. Uh, they're all used up within a day um, because we have enough inpatients who are sick and, uh, and who get it. Um, so these are also very, very limited. And we're not seeing a huge increase in these yet, although they are also, we heard, uh, I heard this morning that they are ramping up. Um, and so Glaxo probably is getting them rolled out faster. We're, we're very hopeful that um, every day, every week, this, these numbers are gonna improve um, and we can some, sort of abandon some of that pessimism that we had for the last few weeks. Okay, um, uh, Kate mentioned uh, BA2 and I, and I know it's, there's a zillion questions in the chat about BA2. BA2 is, a cousin, is an Omicron, right? It is another uh, variant of Omicron that has uh, 20 additional mutations in, in the spike protein and other parts of the viral genome. Uh, BA2 is as different from BA1 as, um, as some of these, as alpha is to gamma, et cetera. So there is a chance for immune escape 
uh, there was a chance of immune escape where even if you had been infected with BA1, could I get infected with BA2? The same way, for example, that people who got infected with alpha absolutely positively got reinfected with gamma um, three or four months later when the gamma wave hit South America, for example. It, it rolled through Brazil, alpha rolled through Brazil in July, and it steamrolled Brazil uh, in, in November. Um, and so even though the strains were similar, they're different enough that the T cells and antibody responses to the original just didn't protect them from the other. That's called immune escape. Um, and, and there's an idea that BA2 might have some immune escape from uh, BA1. At this moment, it doesn't look like that. Uh, but you know we're still waiting to see uh, because BA2 is just rising up now in countries that have very sophisticated surveillance mechanisms uh, like you hear about in um, Scandinavia and in England. So we still need to see really if BA2 has some immune escape. It doesn't appear to be um, any um, more, um, it might be more transmissible than, than BA1. Uh, I think that's actually pretty sure at this point that BA2 is more transmissible, but whether it actually produces more disease isn't clear yet either. Okay, so does Evasheld work against BA1? Yes, quite well, it's been tested and published. We're not worried about it. Uh, does Evasheld work against BA2? There are no papers on this yet. Uh, there are a few scientists who are actually doing those experiments right now, and they've already posted to Twitter, which is where all of you know, I'll just get their news at this point. Uh, they've already posted to Twitter that yes, um, that, that Evasheld does work. The pair of monoclonals that make up Evasheld do protect against BA2 as well. Uh, and the prediction is based on where those 20 other additional mutations are in BA2 versus BA1, it shouldn't affect the binding of the two Evusheld uh, antibodies. We have enough capability to predict binding that this is um, a pretty comfortable prediction at this point. Will citrovimab work against BA1? The treatment monoclonal, will it against BA1? Absolutely, yes, uh, it definitely does. Will it work against BA2? Yes, that's already been tested and, um, and, and at least people are, are showing their data from laboratory studies uh, these, these papers are in review. They're not published, they're not peer reviewed yet, but against um, very, very good groups that have been studying COVID for years, when they say things like, yes, in our hands, it works pretty well, you know, we have to take that as, as pretty good. So uh, hopefully this will help you answer some of the questions that I know uh, many of you have about the monoclonals. Okay, we're gonna move on to the antivirals now. The antivirals um, act differently. So remember the monoclonals act here for the virus to bind to ACE2 and then remember it injects that RNA into the cell. That's this part here. The virus sticking to ACE2 and injecting the RNA into the cell, fusing and injecting its RNA into the cell. That RNA has to be turned into viral proteins and the viral RNA has to be copied and those viral proteins make up new viruses and the viral RNAs go into those new viruses, and then you make new viruses that leave the cell and form an infection. So one cell infected here may produce thousands of viruses that go to other cells nearby, and then they're gonna infect other cells, and they're gonna infect other cells. And so each one of your cells gets turned into a little factory of viruses. That's the way viruses work. Um, so the monoclonals block up here, keeping the virus from going into your cells. The antivirals work down here. Uh, they prevent the viral proteins from being turned into being cut up and assembled properly like you know like when you're building legos you have to put the red brick next to the yellow brick and if you stack them just right up properly you'll make a nice virus coat and then it can infect another cell but if you don't allow the bricks to be stacked up properly then the viral proteins don't form right that's what paxlovid does it's the pfizer monoclonal sorry antiviral uh, and then there's another one called Monup Molnupravir, and that um, it works very similarly to remdesivir in that it jams up the polymerase that is used to copy RNA. So um, the viral RNA has to be copied, and you have to make lots of copies of it, put it into viruses, and then package them out. So if you could screw up the copying process of the RNA, then you can uh, prevent the virus from forming more viruses. That's the way remdesivir works. That's the way Molnupravir works. Um, so hopefully you guys can understand the difference between monoclonals and antivirals. These antivirals can work in parallel, in synergy, uh, in compl to complement the monoclonals. It's not like you get one or the other. We have admitted patients just in the last few weeks who got monoclonals uh, for treatment and who got remdesivir um, and uh, Paxlovid for treatment. So we, we definitely can use these in consort if patients are sick. Um, um, yeah. So these supplies are limited too. <laughs> wah, wah. So this is from LA County's website. Uh, and you know we, we've been told over and over again that supplies are very, very limited. LA County, on if you click and click and click, you can actually find down on the bottom of this list is every pharmacy that has Paxlovid available. This is updated every few days. It's not real time locator like you know 
um, like you're tracking your, your Grubhub uh, dinner, but it's good enough that you might be able to call these pharmacies and say, can I get this Paxlovid there? And um, that's what we do. And so for one of our patients who needed Paxlovid, uh, one of our clinical fellows called and called and called a bunch of these pharmacies, found one that was available and got it uh, prescribed. So this is what, still what you'll have to do while the supplies are limited. Um, and I think every state probably has some similar uh, website like this. Uh, I thought it'd be an interesting piece of trivia to eject at this point that Molnupravir was named after Molnir, the, the hammer that Thor carries around. I didn't know this until I was, Kate, did you know this? No, you, no, you didn't know this either. Okay. I didn't know this. And uh, it's named after Mjolnir. My, I'm sure my teenagers would pronounce this better than me because they, they're Avengers fans. And hopefully you're an Avenger fan too, because anyway, this is this is what the, the Thor's hammer Mjolnir uh, was was. Uh, used to name this drug. Okay, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about which PID patients get sick from COVID. There's been a dozen studies at this point um, from very, very uh, renowned groups, including uh, Dr. Sullivan here on this international study uh, that was um, the first author is Isabel from uh, Belgium. Uh, and but other groups in Iran and all over the world have looked at which COVID, which uh, PID patients or IEI patients are more likely to get uh, severe COVID. Uh, I'm going to summarize and distill all that down for you as best as I can here to say that uh, those people who have pure antibody defects are, are happen to be on the milder end of the spectrum, and those who have T cell defects uh, tend to have more severe disease. Uh, superimposed on that are the known risk factors that we know, which are age and obesity, diabetes, hypertension, uh, coronary disease, et cetera. Those are superimposed on top of it. But this is great because the majority of you on the call have an antibody defect and, um, and in general have, have been very well tolerated compared to those patients with T cell defects. Um, there are other defects too. And I'm gonna take the chance to um, re-advertise a consortium that uh, many of us are in to try to identify what are the rare genetic uh, lesions that lead to susceptibility to COVID. So in patients who are young and who don't have those comorbidities, these little guys here who end up with severe disease, even though they don't have any of the risk factors, can we understand their genetics to understand why they got so sick, even though nobody else in their classroom got sick? These are the kids that you hear about who are getting very, very uh, and the young adults, et cetera. Uh, we're also interested in those patients who are old and who have lots of comorbidities and yet don't get sick. Their bedmate got sick, their neighbor got sick, their coworkers are all sick and they're not sick. This resistor population is also interesting to us. We're uh, finally having an effort to um, collect and sequence these patients to identify are there genes and pathways that protect patients from, from COVID infection. So these two rare groups have been studied by uh, an effort called the COVID human Gen genetic effort. This is led by Helen Sue at the NIH and John Casanova at the Rockefeller. Um, and, and together those two have built, uh, and, and a lot of us have built a coalition around the world, um, 18 time zones over over 100 centers around the world are now collecting genomes from patients. Here's our little UCLA icon down here. Um, collecting genomes, collecting patients from all over, uh, whatever we can do um, to try to uh, gather patients and say, can we understand why these pe people are getting sick or not sick? There's um, on the rare disease level, there's common variants being studied by another genetic effort that's uh, led by Mark Daly at the Broad Institute. Um, our institutions uh, have been contributing to these. Um, we, we collected 700 genomes of, of severely ill COVID patients across the University of California system and contributed them to this effort. So we've made some progress. The progress has shown that beyond that T cell thing that I showed just a minute ago, there's a collection of, of genetic variants in this pathway called type one interferon that seems to be really important uh, to protect from COVID. So if your virus goes into your cells, remember I showed you how it injects into the cell, that viral RNA can be detected by something called TLR3 and, and turns on a signal, an alarm saying the British are coming, uh, or in this case, the respiratory viruses are coming and they produce this type one interferon, which then other cells can sense what? viruses are coming, and then they can turn on their machinery, their viral antiviral programs called ISGs to stop viral spread uh, wherever they can. So if you can turn on your interferon program early enough, you probably won't get a lot of spread in your own lungs and you may not get that sick. This is the program when it's running right, it's probably why there's so much asymptomatic COVID. Uh, that people can get infected, it can spread a little bit, it turns on this program, your, uh, your interferons are driving everything saying, whoa, 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 don't come here, don't come here, we're, we're protected, and then the virus can spread and you clear the infection and it's over. So patients who have lesions, genetic lesions, rare diseases in any of these genes and these pathways uh, have been now identified as having a special risk to COVID uh, and to other respiratory viral infections too, by the way. 
Uh, and those genes are included here in the figure before, or you can see here on a list. These are papers now that are being published in, in big journals and from, from these large consortia of hundreds of patients. Uh, in general, these rare genetic lesions explain about 4%, maybe 5% of severe COVID. Uh, one out of 20 severe COVID patients, even young or old, uh, can probably explain this way. The other 19 out of 20 patients that we take care of in the, in the ICUs, et cetera, that you read about in the news, um, they probably don't have rare genetic diseases. Um, there are other reasons for them to get sick, and we could talk about that in Q&A, like anti-interferon antibodies and stuff like that. Okay, the questions come up that I'm supposed to address about COVID antibodies. When will our IG have COVID antibodies? Uh, as Dr. Shulman mentioned, um, uh, we're very hopeful that as patients who themselves recover from COVID or got vaccinated with the COVID vaccine, they themselves will donate plasma, at which point it'll go into the IG supply, or it can be used as convalescent plasma. Um, and indeed, uh, we looked at it last year, early in COVID, to see does any IG contain antibodies that might be protected for COVID. We did find uh, in a paper that there are lots of cross-reactive antibodies to other coronaviruses in Ig, of course, because a lot of those Ig donors have been infected with other coronaviruses before they ended up giving. But um, none of the Ig products back in last summer, or sorry, two summers ago, were protective for COVID. We tested that and, and published it. But let's fast forward. What about if we move from 2020 into 2021? Can we start expecting some of these people, some of these IG supplies to develop some COVID antibodies? And the answer is yes. Um, so many groups have now published that the donor pool started developing more and more uh, antibodies in the, in, the, um, um, in, the, in, the, in the plasma that's being collected from donors. Uh, Takeda published, that last figure was from Takeda, this one too, that back in January of 2021, now a full year ago, they predicted that there were so many donors showing up with, with antibodies to COVID that they would, by last summer, have some level of protection in the COVID, in the plasma pool. Uh, that was followed up later by a paper from Okta Pharma uh, last uh, summer, late in summer. Um, so th this paper was in January of 2021. This paper was in August of 2021. And they found just like Takeda that the number of donors who had antibodies against COVID uh, were rising exponentially fast. Uh, they found this exponential increase, not a straight line increase because of vaccines. Many of these patients um, were not just previously disinfected themselves, but also had a vaccine. They were predicting in this paper that by the end of summer 2021, that um, there would be enough convalescent uh, plasma level uh, COVID protective antibodies in the, in the plasma pool of the of collected uh, patients. Um, Takeda published later, now fast forward again into November 2021, the end of November or mid-November. They published the same thing that their plasma donors are showing more and more and more protective antibodies. Um, they found that these protective antibodies were converging to the level of vaccinated donors, uh, which is amazing. That means that the plasma pool really is like getting, uh, like being vaccinated uh, by the end of summer last summer. Uh, the paper came out uh, now about a month and a half ago. Uh, and finally, CSL published uh, a few weeks after that, right at early Jan early December 2021, so one month ago, one and a half months ago, that they saw the same thing. So CSL, Griffles, Takeda, uh, uh, they're Okta, they're all saying the same thing, that their donor pool is loaded with donors who have themselves been either infected or vaccinated. CSL's paper suggested that around April was an inflection point where the donors who were infected became less and less. The donors who were vaccinated became more and more. And in fact, more and more and more to the point that it was many fold, again, by summer 2021, just like everyone was saying, by summer 2021, there were many times the level of the mean convalescent plasma concentration of COVID blocking antibodies. That's what MCPC means. So by summer 2021, all, all the big manufacturers were saying that the donor pool was providing enough antibodies into the product that when back packaged together should provide a many times protective level uh, of, of, of treatment of convalescent plasma at the level of a vaccinated individual. But those products aren't actually going into people's arms yet. Uh, they have to sit on a shelf and make their way into the supply chain. There's that supply chain. And then eventually it'll go in. Uh, some of the manufacturers have been telling us that it takes nine months uh, for their product from the date of plasma collection to the time that it gets into someone's um, subcutaneous or intravenous product into someone's arm. Uh, it could be in six months, it could be nine months, it could be a year. That's the unfortunate part that we're facing right now. We have started to see our patients showing antibodies 
to COVID in their, uh, from their IG. XLA patients who make no antibodies of their own, they are already showing COVID protective antibodies. So I think we're right at the cusp now uh, where we're starting to see these products making their way six months after last summer is now. Um, so some of these products are making their way into people's arms. We can measure detectable COVID antibodies in these patients. So uh, I think the an big answer to the question is yes, um, protection is on the way. Uh, natural infection and vaccination campaigns are producing huge amounts of antibodies. All the manufacturers are identifying these presence of huge amounts of antibodies in the donor pool. Uh, remember that IVIG and uh, subcutaneous IG is a replacement dose is much higher dose than what we would give therapeutically for convalescent plasma. So we think that actually patients getting IG replacement are gonna have a really great amount of protection uh, as time goes on. And we also know that prevention is better than a cure. And so that if we can prevent COVID like Evusheld uh, or through uh, IG replacement uh, antibodies that we'll be able to protect a lot of patients from disease. Okay. Oh, that was the end of my segment. Um, and I think we're gonna try to use the rest of the time to answer questions. Okay, well, you know what? A huge, huge thank you to both of you for this wonderful, wonderful information. Oh my goodness. And um, at this time, we are definitely going to turn things over to the three of you to um, answer as many questions as possible during the time we have left. And before I turn it over to you though, Colleen, I did have some questions in the chat that has nothing to do with COVID, but people said, where are all the sponsors and why aren't they all <laughs> talking to us tonight? And um, I said, I will tell everybody that we have um, a new, forum format this year, and it is where one company will be speaking to everybody um, during each forum. And then the other companies have been absolutely phenomenal about creating um, short videos that we're going to be able to show to everybody so we can all know about all the services that are available to us in our community. So um, looking forward to hearing from a different sponsor in two weeks and seeing different videos in the, in a couple weeks. But anyway, with that, I am going to turn this over to the Q&A over to my colleague, colleague, Colleen Brock. And she is the manager of medical programs at IDEA. So Colleen, Dr. Sullivan, Dr. Butte, take it away. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, everybody. Uh, amazing questions. They have just been tremendous questions. I think I'm now at over 400 questions. So yeah, we're not going to answer all those questions, or we'll be here till tomorrow. And these aren't the repetitive questions. Um, so what I will ask, I'm going to try to ask them as quickly and clearly as I possibly can. And if the two of you can do the same, then hopefully we can get through a majority of the questions. We're not gonna get to them all. If you would like to have an answer to your question and, it, and it's a burning question, please reach out to Ask IDF on the website and we will attempt to answer your questions as best we can. And we will get the experts' opinions and thoughts and what we know, and, and we will provide you with that information. Having said that, let's go. I'm gonna kind of start with you, Dr. Sullivan, and then I'm kind of go down, but Dr. Butte, if you wanna chime in, feel free. So let's go with what has been the outcome of PIDD patients who have contracted COVID, how sick are they getting? How quickly are they recovering? Keep separate long COVID. I have a lot of questions about that and we'll get to that, but just in general, how sick are people getting with COVID? The immune deficiency per se does not seem to be a major risk factor, but as we know, there are people with PI who also have lung damage, liver damage, some other organ that's affected. So the impact of the immune deficiency on those organs seems to drive most of the risk. Is there a particular PI that you are finding is having the most serious complications? 
not yes. the comorbidities, but the PI itself. So Manish talked about um, the large consortium that had identified mm -hmm. interferon defects. A key thing to know is that those are not people with recurrent infections. Those aren't people on immunoglobulin replacement. Those are people who were fine, 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 got COVID and were super sick. There are a couple of immune deficiencies. So I don't know that there's anyone on the webinar. So thymoma is an acquired immune deficiency due to a thymic tumor in the chest. APESED, which is a mutation in a gene called AIR. Um, and then there's one study that suggests that hyper IgE syndrome has a higher rate of severe COVID. So there are some select immune deficiencies. These are very specific niche diagnoses. So they're not the typical immune deficiencies, but Manish, you were also talking about T cell defects in your section. Yeah, uh, I think I, in um, a handful of these papers, some patients with SCID uh, um, or combined immune deficiencies um, had more complications from, from, from COVID. I think the way, the way I think about it is that you can get by if you don't have antibodies. Uh, because the antibodies help prevent the spread of the virus uh, through the lungs. But you need T cells afterwards to come and clear the virus. The only way that we really have to get rid of virus after it's infected itself is to kill those cells that are virally infected. And that's the role of T cells. So, um, so it's very hard to survive severe infections if you don't have uh, working T cells. Now, even our patients with combined immune deficiencies uh, oftentimes have some degree of working T cells or enough numbers of T cells that they can still get through it. And there are now actually papers, I think, didn't Sarah Hendrickson publish one, where there was a, even a patient with SCID who survived yeah. COVID and didn't die from it, surprisingly. So again, these are not absolutes. Every one of these disorders, um, uh, you know, is, is every one of you with your disorders is your own disease. Uh, they cannot be painted with one broad brush. But uh, if I tried to paint with a broad brush, it, it was the it was the ex examples that I that I gave and that um, Dr. Sullivan just mentioned. Well, and thank you for mentioning combined immune deficiency because we did have somebody, and I was just going to ask you. They they wanted to know. Lots of comments have been about CVID, but what about them? And how is COVID affecting that population? So thank you for that input. Um, next question, is there evidence suggesting that someone with IgA deficiency or any other PI would respond differently or more severely with Omicron than they did with a previous variant? No, I think, um, again, it's always kind of this tension between the inoculum and how much antibody you have. So if you're IgA deficient and that's all, you will make IgG to the previous infection, that'll provide you some protection, but that, so that protection is great, that's wonderful, but it can be overcome by a large inoculum of virus. Someone coughs in your face, most commonly seen with household infections. So where you're really living with the person, not you passed someone eight feet away in the office. So um, yes, you could definitely get infected again. Would it necessarily be more severe? No, not likely. Okay. Thank you. Would there be a reason for someone with good syndrome and why they would not test positive for COVID even though they had several rapids and antigen tests done? Manish, you wanna take good syndrome? Sure, uh, yeah. So the tests for COVID are not testing your response for COVID. Uh, we do uh, epidemiologists who want to know how much COVID is spreading in different communities. Uh, measure the spread of COVID and the infection of COVID by looking at the antibodies to COVID. Uh, that is done on a public health level, on a populational level, um, but it is not the way we diagnose any one person with COVID. We never use antibodies as a diagnosis for acute COVID. We either me measure the proteins themselves of the virus, that's called an antigen test, or we measure the RNA of the virus, that's a PCR test. Uh, and good syndrome patients should have either antigen positivity, if the viral proteins are present, or a PCR positive test if the viral RNA is present. So no, there, there should be nothing related there. Okay. Um, you talked about BA1 and BA2. This person says, I thought I heard that BA2 was reinfecting people who have had BA1. Are you seeing or hearing anything about that? Wait, I'm sorry, say that again. 
Are you hearing that people who had BA1 are now being reinfected with BA2? No, there was that possibility. And, and again, we, yeah, I don't think that's the case yet. Okay. Um, the places where BA1 had dominated over Delta uh, are now showing BA2 dominating over BA1. Uh, but that doesn't mean that people are being reinfected with BA2. It just means that the dominant strains are switching from BA1 to BA2. Kate, is that the way you read it too? Yeah, and remember, no one is sequencing these strains in real time. It's not like when the swab goes to the lab, it's being sequenced. There's a subset that's being collected and sent to the CDC, and a month later, they all get sequenced. So very hard to know in any one person what strain they're being infected with. A doctor in Oregon said shingles is a new comorbidity with COVID. Are you hearing or seeing this? Do you know about this? Yeah, I've had a couple patients with that. So remember COVID infection is super immune suppressive. One of the biomarkers of severity is having low lymphocytes. And so we, so people that people in the general population, so people without PI that get COVID, they have a significant risk of secondary infections. Shingles is among them. Okay. What about people who test positive for COVID? They have the symptoms. They need to have a negative test to go back to work, to, to go wherever, and they're testing positive again and again and again. Are they still contagious? And what can they do to tell their employer, whoever, whoever is requiring it, that they are no longer contagious, even though they are testing positive? Or are they still positive? Super hard question that I'm going to defer to Manish. <laughs> Wait, I was typing in two answers while you were asking. I'm sorry. <laughs> Helene, go. Give me it again. Oh. I'm typing as fast as I can here. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. So people who are testing positive and they have COVID, okay? They've recovered now, but they need a test to either go back to work, whatever, attend a gathering, and they're positive but they have no symptoms. Are they contagious? Are, are, do they still have COVID? And what do they do? What do they tell people? Okay. Yeah, uh, the CDC long ago said, don't keep testing. If you had COVID and 10 days have gone by, it doesn't matter. Your virus is done. Uh, and you can keep secreting in your saliva and, and even in the poop, um, the RNA. So the, as the debris from the battlefield is cleared and you're hawking up all this stuff and swallowing it and it gets in your tract and you, and you do a test, you'll get that RNA. It'll keep showing up and it can show up for 90 days after your infection. Uh, and it's the same virus that you had 90 days ago. It's still in your saliva. It's still in your poop. It's still in your, the back of your throat. Uh, but the, it's not the virus, the whole virus, the infectious virus. It's just little debris of RNA that is detectable by these incredibly sensitive tests. Um, so if 10 days have gone by after your start of symptoms, you're no longer infectious, all that RNA that is detectable is just debris and it's not interesting. And you certainly can go back to work if your symptoms are better. Uh, you shouldn't go back to work if you're sick and febrile and not feeling well, of course. Uh, but beyond that, you're not going to spread COVID after 10 days after your infection. What is the likely of severity of illness for a fully vaccinated and boosted person? who receives monthly IVIG? I think a lot of it depends on if that vaccine and booster worked, right? About half of our patients um, with CVID, we've been lucky to get them back again after giving them the vaccines and the boosters. And we've tested their antibody levels with the caveat that uh, Kate mentioned earlier that these antibody tests are all, mm, yes, <laughs> 12, like they give you a number, but what does it mean? So, you know, um, yes, we've done that. And about half of our patients make antibody responses like like normals like they're just normally making antibody responses even though they have cvid even though they don't make antibody responses to pneumovax or the tetanus or other stuff so why why is this vaccine work and not other vaccines work i don't have that answer for you but about half of our patients are making antibody responses to the vaccine uh great that that provides you the protection that you need and if not there's the usual show and if not there's the ig products that are soon going to have some igs in them so i, I think that's the way to, the right way to think about it this is an interesting question. Have you heard of immune deficiencies worsening due to COVID? I assume the person gets COVID. 
have been hearing reports of T cells dropping after COVID, CD4, CD8, CD45RO, and another lymphocyte subset panel are dropping post-infection. Yes, even in the general population, COVID, as I said, it's a, it's a very immune suppressive infection. And one of the biomarkers of severity is how low the lymphocytes drop. And it is predominantly T cells that drop. It does take an impressive amount of time for recovery. So I haven't seen any study where the T cell numbers have gotten back to normal. So no one's gone out three months, but even at two months, you can still detect the lymphopenia. So um, yeah, it, this is a, for the people that get sick with it, this is a bad virus. And is this something like, who should be concerned about this happening? Does this happen to everybody with an immune deficiency or does this happen for those that have severe COVID? So it happens to everyone, immune deficiency or not. The degree of lymphopenia tracks at least somewhat with the severity of the symptoms. Um, and so I would think it would also happen in people with PI. I don't think they're accepted from that. And the recovery time is variable, but it's months, not days or weeks. And so there are consequences to that. So I mentioned that there is a window when people are vulnerable to secondary infections, and we do worry about that. Um, but I don't think there's a unique aspect to people with PI, at least as, as far as I know. So let's talk about antibody testing for a little bit. Um, Dr. Butte, with Viacor testing, which we talked about on the last uh, forum, what is considered to be a protective level, especially regarding the T cells? Oh, it keeps coming back over and over again. Okay, so yep. um, so Quest and LabCorp offer semi-quantitative uh, antibody levels to spike antigens with antibodies that bind to the spike that sort of bind to the spike. Uh, will they protect you? Uh, we didn't know that. We know that the higher the number, the more likely it is in general. Spike detecting antibodies, RBD detecting antibodies are more protective uh, the higher the number is. Uh, and that's why they offer that test. Viracore now offers a neutralizing assay where they use a viral infection to see whether your plasma can neutralize virus. That is a much more functional test. And they give a number in their result that says this level of antibody is neutralizing, is protective. So um, that number changes based on their method, et cetera, their controls, but, but that, that is a way of detecting antibodies that are functional, that are neutralizing. Okay. Are antibody test results skewed by those who use Ig replacement? Antibodies against spike are, um, as I showed in our own paper, detectable in the Ig products, even in, in, in my plasma, your plasma, uh, but um, but they're not neutralizing. So wait, what was the original question? <laughs> what was the question? I started on a thread and then I lost. Does it does it skew the results if yeah. you're on immunoglobulin replacement? Not yet. I think not remember, the test hopeful, for the they're antibodies. Hopeful that there will be. Uh, I'm sorry. Not the test for the vaccine antibodies, but if you are testing from for antibodies to COVID. Are they skewed by your infusions or are they your own? Okay. Well, we don't test antibodies to COVID for detecting COVID, right? As I mentioned earlier, we look for either the viral antigens themselves, the proteins themselves, or the RNA as a way of detecting COVID. The only time that we really, really measure antibodies to COVID are if you're part of some epidemiological surveillance study where they will actually look for non-spike. They tend to look for nucleocapsid antibodies because it's actually a more immunogenic part of the virus. Or if you're getting these tests sent off to Quest, LabCorp, or ViraCorp to see if you've made protective antibodies, maybe because you've had some rituximab in the past and your doctor wasn't sure if you've made antibodies. So you can get those, those tests done. Does the presence of IVIG influence that result? Uh, it will, it will over time as those Ig products contain antibodies against spike and nucleocapsid for people who got infected or got vaccinated. Uh, those antibodies will be detectable in those kinds of assays, yes. Uh, but you know, at this point, as I mentioned, we're just at that cusp where people who are getting Ig are able to be detected with that, with that, with, as having uh, anti-spike antibodies when you measure them. Kate, have you have you seen that in your patients, like XLA patients? Have you seen anti-spike antibodies? Yeah, we have seen some, um, some I, I don't wanna say false positive, they're truly positive, but it's from immunoglobulin, yeah. not from them. Yeah. Question for Dr. Sullivan. 
After COVID infection, antibodies need to be there, but once recovered from the virus, there is no reason to still have antibodies. Doesn't protection involve the memory cells to ramp up antibody generation if you get infected? Confused why we hear about how many antibodies you have when you shouldn't have antibodies if you're well. Sorry if this is confusing. Um, it, it is confusing. I hear you. So, but just think for a minute. So when I was little, I had chicken pox. I still have antibodies to that chicken pox. I won't tell you how many decades ago it was. And the reason I do is that I have plasma cells in my bone marrow. So the B cells in the blood turn into plasma cells that go to the bone marrow and they set up shop and they live there for a very long time. So they're like little factories that churn out antibody for literally decades and decades. So after you get COVID, you can see a wave of antibody in the blood, but it doesn't usually go back down to zero because those plasma cells in the bone marrow keep churning out some. Same is true with vaccination. You see this big um, production of antibody right after the vaccine, it kind of tapers down, um, doesn't usually go to zero. There's usually still some production by these plasma cells. Thank you. Where does 22Q fit in the groups of non-responders for the antibodies? That's a question if I've ever heard one. <laughs> Um, I did actually try to answer it in the chat, but uh, maybe there are more, more than just one person asking about 22Q. So we think that largely antibody responses to the vaccine are fine in 22Q. Has not been a large study, but actually I'm helming, the reason Manish said that is I'm helming a large survey study to try and look at that. Awesome. Back to good syndrome, having an IFITM3 genetic mutation in relation to COVID testing and having all kinds of false negatives with rapid and PCR testing. Thoughts as to why this has happened? So Manish and I love genes more than anything else on the planet, Stump but the I'm, doctor. I'm literally Googling I fit in one, so. Okay, Kelly, you're saying this is a patient who has good syndrome who has an underlying IEI of I fit, I, I fit three deficiency and they don't del they don't show what? They're having They're false negative testing. Maybe they don't have COVID? They're having both negative rapid and PCR testing. Maybe they don't have COVID? No, it sounds like they have symptoms. But, but when they flu, go to get tested, they're the, negative. It could be paraflu. You know, paraflu went around, gave our a couple of our fellows sore throats the other week. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Stump the doctor, they win the prize. Yeah. I don't uh -oh. have an answer either. I don't have an answer either. And I was Googling furiously. <laughs> okay. Well, let's move on. <laughs> Vaccines. <laughs> There's a lot of questions about the Moderna being a half a dose. And I apologize if I repeat some things you did discuss. I had a major electronic malfunction in the middle of some of the presentation. Um, but I just wanna clarify, Pfizer is a full dose on that fourth vaccine, but the Moderna is a half dose. Canada is doing a full dose. Some are saying, why are we not doing a full dose? Should they do a Pfizer because they shouldn't get the half dose? What, is, what are your thoughts regarding the half versus full and which one they should do? Um, it doesn't make a difference. So there are, so for people that are worried about the half dose of Moderna, there are some data, not abundant data, but some data suggesting that the Moderna overall is stronger and more durable than Pfizer. So I would say probably it's a wash. I wouldn't go out of my way to try and swap brands. Um, right now, there's not a lot of data other than to say swapping brands doesn't seem to overall make a difference. So I wouldn't be too concerned about the half dose somehow being less robust than a full dose of Pfizer, just because in general, the Moderna seems just like a smidge um, stronger and more durable at inducing responses. But Manisha, you, I think you've actually looked at it. Do you have a different opinion? I'm talking and I realize you have data. Again, sorry, I was typing. What did you, what's, what did you say? Do you, so how do you feel? I, I, I sometimes type and 
Yeah, it's hard to look at both. Like, so do you think I have can't even multitask at this point? We're, so, we're gonna hire a third so doctor. Well just here, answer questions. Questions. I'm like, I can get through this. And Colleen and, and Kathy, you guys are like, we'll get through them all. Okay, sorry. Mm. Oh, I'm listening I'm listening. Do you think a half so in the booster moment, do you think a half dose of Moderna is any less robust than a full dose of Pfizer? Oh yeah, yeah. Um did not make these questions up. These people are very smart. <laughs> uh, I don't know, but I, I, if it were up to me, I would go to Moderna. It's a bigger. So, dose. I, bigger. I, and I had said that there's a little bit of data suggesting Moderna is a little stronger. So, okay. you yeah. might, you might just go with the half dose of Moderna, figuring yes. you've already wrung the most out of it. And to be honest, I think a big part of the booster effect is just getting more antigen, not necessarily the amount of antigen because your immune system's seen it. You're just kind of reawakening it. And so the dose may not actually be the biggest variable. You just want a little bit of time between your primary series and your booster. And I think that's the key thing. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the length of efficacy for the vaccines? Do we know that yet? You know, how long, like, we're going to get another one. And then are we going to get another one in six months? Is it going to last a year? Is it, I mean, do we have any idea? I think you have to think about it from the, like a public health point of view and an immunology point of view, at least that's the way I think about it. From an immunology point of view, it's just like Kate said a little bit earlier, you can measure memory T cells and memory B cells in, in healthy people who receive vaccine for years, if not a decade later. It's not, um, not at all a problem to measure memory T cells uh, to tetanus 10 years later. And it'll be the same thing for these COVID vaccines. You'll be able to measure tetanus, or sorry, COVID specific T cell, memory T cells and B cells a decade later. But is the circulating amount of antibody in your blood at, at such a high enough level to prevent infection uh, when somebody coughs or sneezes on you or you're, you're inside of an, an indoor setting, et cetera, um, that level, how high it is now is not a question of, can we measure those T cells and B cells, which is yes, but that level itself goes down over time. That's the way all of our immune systems work. We make antibodies in response to vaccines through infection and those antibodies circulate in our blood and they get recycled and then new infections and new antibodies are filling up our blood all the time that otherwise our blood would fill up with antibodies. And so those antibody levels will go down over time. And if they go down below a certain level from a public health point of view, not an immunology can you detect point of view, uh, people start getting more and more infections again. And so that, that was the basis of when we give boosters is not so much that we fail to detect those T cells. They're still there, they're there. Six months later, they'll be there six years from now. But is your antibody level enough to protect you? That's a public health question. And the decision was made to make the boosters, you know, five or six months. Yeah. It's been empirically how long it takes before people start getting infected again. My son has IgA issues. I've heard Omicron is bad for IgA deficiencies, but the vaccine impacts IgM and IgG. Can you explain? I mean, should they still get the vaccine? Um, everyone should get the vaccine. Uh, there are some people, <laughs> period, uh, but... <laughs> Uh, but there's some people for whom they're not going to be able to make protective responses to the vaccine. Uh, people who are very low in T cells, people who got rituximab and don't have B cells, people who don't have B cells that, because they're born with it. And uh, and those people who aren't going to be able to make a protective response, uh, that's what Evusheld is for, uh, is to try to be, uh, provide protection. I think I've typed this like six times in the answers. Um, it's, Evusheld is made for people who can't respond to the vaccine. Uh, you should get the vaccine. Everybody should get the vaccine. Um, all your family members, all your neighbors, everybody should be getting the vaccine. Um, and for those who can't, that's what Evasheld is for. And hopefully if we have enough vaccine and Evasheld in our society, uh, we'll have some degree of prevention of the virus spreading from person to person. And the rate of spread will drop low enough that it'll spiral downwards instead of upwards. And we call that herd immunity. Then, then it's over. <laughs> Okay, so I really if I that? had three shots, oh, oh, over is a bold word, Manish. Yeah, <laughs> someone's Good gonna quote me like nine months from now. Didn't you say it was had gonna be three over? shots? <laughs> got COVID, need to get the booster. How long do they wait after having COVID? Uh, in general, 
the FDA says 90 days, I think it's not a bad idea to think about um, it this way. When your T cells are turned on, your B cells are turned on after an infection, you want them to calm down, uh, go into some sort of memory mode, and then give those memory cells a boost. Uh, the idea of giving a, a recently activated T cell and B cell more antigen in the form of a booster right after infection doesn't make a lot of sense immunologically. It's better to wait until their memory cells and then give those memory cells a boost to give them a chance to really become great memory cells. So that's why we recommend waiting 90 days um, after infection. Okay. I, th I think there's actually data to support even longer, right, uh, Kate? From 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 your colleague, I, John Larry, <laughs> five months is what he said, or six? He says it. I don't know his data, though. OK. All right, monoclonal antibodies. Go, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> That's OK. Monoclonal antibodies. Can I get a monoclonal antibody treatment and take an antiviral? Yes. I'm assuming they're talking about the citrovimab. Um, okay, so trovimab so treatment and antiviral treatment, either remdesivir if you're under age 12 uh, or uh, so trovimab, uh, or um, Paxlovid or molnupravir if you're over age 12, yes. Right, but you can it's get them at 12, the same time. That's not EUA approved. And so uh, we are giving remdesivir inpatient. Um, it's, I think even if a lot patient now uh, for, right, Kate, didn't we get approved just last yeah. week? Yep. Yeah, uh, yep. for outpatient treatment, yes. Okay. Um, primary immune deficiency conditions are being left off the hospital qualifications for monoclonal antibody treatment. How do you explain in the emergency room that you do qualify? Immune deficiency patients aren't getting treatment with monoclonals like citrovimab? Right, right. They're being told that they're not, they don't qualify, even it's though they're positive. I've heard it. I think because the states are allowed to set their own criteria. So it's just whatever people are cooking up and it's not well-defined like immune compromised. You could interpret that a whole bunch of ways. I, I have heard from patients that they've been declined. So we, we bring them in when we can. Okay. But I think, SJ but the sorry. Question, sorry, I'm just going to, um, I don't mean to preempt Manish, but to empower that person, you mm -hmm. could ask your immunologist for a letter. Um, your immunologist can go to bat for you and advocate for you. And sometimes just having like a letterhead that says, this patient is immune deficient, i.e. immune compromised and should be eligible, I think could go a long way. Yeah. It's actually true, you're right. In the original criteria, even for California, it, it, it mentioned immunocompromising conditions as being those who got solid organ transplant. And we're all like, what? What about our patients? But the local LA County and, and UCLA and many, many groups said, we interpret this as also including conditions that have the same level of immunocompromise as those who got organ transplants, including blah, blah, blah. So I, I think you're, yeah, yeah. Developed SJSF, JS after rituximab for NHL, should they avoid monoclonal antibodies? No reason to. Okay, perfect. Sorry, sorry you had that terrible experience, whoever you are. Yeah. Does donated plasma contain IgA and is that a problem? So when you're having like the, the monoclonals and all of the stuff that- IgA is mostly- it, it, it is of course detectable in the blood, but evolutionarily IgA is meant to be secreted in our tears and our saliva and our respiratory tracts, uh, et cetera. And so, um, yes, there is IgA detectable in our plasma and in the donated plasma products and in immunoglobulin products, uh, but it's a very small fraction of the immunoglobulin and it, it's not really relevant. And it's not okay. in the monoclonals, which I think might've been oh, yeah. part of that question. Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, because of reactions to IgA, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. So they're not going to have the same reactions that they could with IgA infusions. Antivirals, and then we'll get back to Evie Sheldon. Are there clinical studies being done on the use of antivirals in the PI population? And do you know of a way that people can join those studies? <laughs> Stump the doctor. Manish. 
Is it true? Or is anyone collecting patients who've gotten monoclonals who have I, uh, PIDs? Yeah, so Rebecca, Rebecca Marsh put together a survey that I think is being promoted by CIS and IDF. Um, so I think they started two months ago, so it's still early days, but so I, early, okay. I haven't seen the data. And, um, okay, well, I think we, sorry, there's just so, okay, let's go back to Evichel. If you are getting vaccinated, and you are producing antibodies, should you be getting Evichel right now while it is in short supply? No, it is meant for people who can't make protective responses to the vaccine. The vaccine is overwhelmingly a clear way to prevent severe COVID. Clear cut evidence now, we have a year of, a year of evidence. Uh, if you can't make protection from the vaccine, that's what Evichel does for. And is Evichel a free pass to do whatever you want? Front of the line at Disneyland. Yep. Um, <laughs> what kind of free pass are we talking about here? Uh, no, can you take your mask off? Can you go wherever you want? Can I mean? No, if, remember if that you even vaccines the protection, don't. Yeah. Is it hundred percent? Don't prevent COVID. They prevent the severe complications of COVID. Does it spread throughout your lungs? Does it cause a lot of hypoxia? Does it lead to clots? Does it lead to like those are the things that we really hospitalization, intubation. Those are the things we need to prevent with vaccines and it, the vaccines work really well for that. And so does Evichel. So remember the point is these things are keeping you from going to the hospital and getting very sick. Uh, they don't prevent infection itself. The infection um, can come into us and, uh, and be cleared by us or, or it won't spread very far. Uh, that's the point. So I, I wouldn't, if you're going indoors and, and you're in a crowded place, you should be wearing a mask. If you're outdoors and it's not crowded, most of our places uh, say that we don't need to wear a mask at this point. Uh, you know, okay. stick, stick to the same rules. The issue is that you just won't go to the hospital if you get sick. How long oh. does it take to start working? Sorry, Kate. Have a shield? Are you asking about? Yes. yes. On the okay, day you I'll let Manish. It, yeah, it's a monoclonal. So on the day you get it, it's immediately circulating from the muscle tissue into your blood. Uh, and it has to make its way into your respiratory tract. But you know, with every beat of your heart, some of it's pumping around to all your tissues. And so um, probably by the end of that day, you're going to have some degree of protection. So I'm going to come back to the question of what, what can I do? When can I oh. somewhat normalize? Mm -hmm. um, you're ready because... to let people go to the <laughs> grocery store. Mm -hmm. that no, no. It's because a patient asked me um, mm. a question, of course, always inspired by patients. Um, and I I didn't have a good answer for him. So he is a young man who has not been dating in the time of COVID. And he asked a super simple question, when can I start dating? And that would include some level of intimacy and what should he do? And I think that's a super practical question. And I have to say, I didn't have a ready answer. And so between us, we kind of sussed out what his risk level was because everyone's at a different place. Some folks are super risk averse. Others are a little more, I'm ready to move on. So we kind of got to that point and he and I, to get, I was really just a sounding board, came up with if the partner was vaccinated and well, he was willing to accept that there was some small risk. He himself is vaccinated um, and makes at least some level of antibody. So uh, such an interesting conversation though, because of course I'm over 60 dating wasn't in my mind. And so really important to address that there are folks who are trying to maneuver these very difficult waters without a lot of guidance. I didn't have an answer for him. And I think to a certain extent, we, we have to help each other kind of figure out what makes sense. And so I just wanted to add that because this is a patient I've known forever. And he really put me back on my heels saying, listen, we have to nail down this really practical question. I gotta, I gotta find an answer. And, and we don't have all the answers, but having a really open discussion with your immunologist, you can at least figure out something that makes sense to the two of you together. That was my two cents. That's very good. I mean, that, that's excellent. Um, if you are getting every show, do you continue to be vaccinated? So do you get the fourth or do you wait to get the Omicron one? If it comes out, what, what is the status of vaccines if you're receiving every show? If you got every show, that means the vaccines don't work for you. So, no. Okay. 
Kate, what do you think? Did I go too far? Is yeah. it okay to get rituximab and Evisheld on the same day? Yes, one's IV. Rituximab is IV and Evisheld's IM, so no reason to separate no them. No problem. Remember, these if are actually all pretty small doses compared to like intravenous immune globulin. Uh, Evisheld is um, 600 milligrams and uh, rituximab is 1,000 milligrams, maybe six, 700 milligrams, depending on your size. Uh, these are tiny amounts compared to like the 20 grams that you might get to, or 40 grams that you might get intravenously. So that, yeah, no problem. And what about Evisheld and your IG replacement treatment? And is there a difference if it's IV or sub -Q? No problem, no difference. Go ahead, same day, same hour. <laughs> now, Evisheld, interestingly, Evisheld is recommended to be gotten in the, I don't know if you know this, in the gluteal muscles. Mm -hmm. I know, so old school, but it's just recommended. You can actually yeah. fly your own flag with that. We, we're sort of thinking about like, do we need to have a, a chaperone available if someone's gonna pull their pants down in clinic? And it actually adds logistical hurdles for us. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. we decided to go with thighs. That makes sense. We'll take your we're, just, down, we're like, right? we're, we're, we're averse to any complications. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, if you receive Evisheld and then you're directly exposed to COVID, now what do you do? Well, you should be comfortable knowing that you're likely to not get severe complications, not likely to go to the hospital, not likely to need oxygen support, blah, blah, blah. So that's the plus. On the other hand, you're likely to get infected, right? This virus is very infectious. It may spread in your nose, maybe in the back of your throat a little bit. You might develop a cough, you might develop a fever. You're not, it doesn't utterly protect from sickness. It is not a shield from the, from this virus, but, um, but it will protect you from the more serious complications. And, and so if you do get sick, uh, you have to isolate yourself, um, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, for at least five and mostly 10 days. Once you qualify to receive it, are you going to continuously receive it every six months and qualify for that? And how long do you think this is going to go on? COVID will be over in six months. <laughs> We're not going to worry about it for your second dose of a shell. Don't worry about it. No. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I do think, you know, a was developed from monoclonals that were developed from the original strain um, and super lucky that it happens to bind to portions of the spike uh, that block and yet aren't affected by the mutations in Omicron or Delta or Gamma or the original. And so, um, so a we're so lucky. Uh, but the next set of strains that, that have mutations could eliminate Evisheld protection and citrovimab treatment the same way that the, the Lily and the Regeneron monoclonals got wiped off because enough mutations means that the tape won't stick and then it comes off. So we can't really predict what the next mutations will be in the next six months. Uh, God willing, there'll be Evisheld 2 at that point, you know, that we can use to prevent infection. Uh, but I, I don't have a crystal ball. And I think it's being optimistic to some degree. COVID is done. If you have a history of reactions to IG products, does that mean you're going to have a reaction to every shell? Um, IG products like like infused IV uh, intravenous right. immune globulin. Right. The yeah. replacement therapy. If yeah. you can take the that reactions product. To, most of the reactions to intravenous or subcutaneous immune globulin are not allergic reactions. Uh, they're due to the dose or the rate or all this immunologically active protein pouring into your blood. Um, and, and those are not contraindications for getting Evisheld or Citrovimab treatment. Do Can you I know? insert a question mm -hmm. that's related? Mm -hmm. There's a, a similar question or a related question in the chat, mm -hmm. but I think I know the answer to, but Manish, can I just run it past you? So Cynthia is saying, she has been told that you have to get the vaccines two weeks before, you have to get the COVID vaccine two weeks before or 90 days after. I've read the EUA. I don't think there's any comment on vaccines and Evashield, but do you, you might have read other literature. Um, it is in the EUA. It's a, I just looked at this beforehand. In individuals who have received the COVID-19 vaccine, Evashield should be administered uh, at least two weeks after vaccination. That, that's what it says. But we, we weren't, that's about vaccination. We were asked about uh, intravenous immune globulin or rituximab, not, not uh, the vaccine. 
I was just trying to pile on. Wait two weeks. Why should you wait two weeks? Uh, Because if there is a chance that the vaccine is going to work for your T cells, say your B cells are not working so well, but your T cells might respond to the vaccine and they may really enjoy that antigen coming in, getting primed by some of that RNA and the dangerous signals from the RNA. And you're going to make some good protective memory T cell responses as a result of the vaccine. We want to give your T cells every chance to get that response. If you've given yourself every shield, which may block the spike from ever getting to your T cells and giving your T cells some response to the vaccine, then why did you get the vaccine? So that's why they say, wait two weeks, give your T cells a chance to respond to the vaccine, make some of the good memory cells from that, uh, even if your antibodies weren't gonna be able to protect you. So two weeks. Sounds good. And the antivirals, do we have any knowledge as to how they are working in the PI community itself? Uh, they should work fine. Um, I know it's new, but yeah, they should they should be work fine. They're they're mostly being used by patients who are immunocompromised and getting admitted uh, to the to the hospital. And there's no way when you are doing antibody testing to determine what antibodies are from the donors and which ones you have made yourself. Correct. Oh, no. no way to do that. <laughs> Um, no way to do that. <laughs> all right. I think we're just about at the end. There's just uh, the one thing that I want to touch on, and Kathy and I are going to have to go back and talk about is I have a lot of questions about long COVID. So my thought is that maybe we do a separate forum on long COVID and just kind of talk about where, what we know, what people are struggling with, how it's being treated and and maybe bring that into it. Because I, I've probably got 20 questions here on, on people who are facing issues with long COVID. I don't think it's a lot. If either one of you chime in on, want to chime in on that one, as far as the percentage that are struggling with it. And if there's one PI more than another that is, but I think that's something that maybe we kind of look at for a future. We might have more data. Oh, we might have more data um, in a few months when this large survey, because they are purposely collecting data on lung COVID. So you might just wait a bit and then there would be some good data right now. All, as far as I know, Manish, please correct me. All the data on long COVID comes from the general population. There's not even a hint of data in PI as far as I know. Right. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I know that there's a, a upcoming um, patient uh, a, a symposium from uh, Immunoglobulin National Society, another one of the advocacy groups that advocates for patients with PI and um, they've invited Petter Broden to talk about long COVID. He's uh, an expert. And um, so I don't know if you guys have access to their seminar series, but I, I don't know when it is. I think it's coming up in the summer, but I think he, he would be a great person to hear. He's published quite a bit. He's himself a pediatric immunologist, but has also published quite a bit on long COVID and the immune system. You know, I, I think there's I think there's a lot about long COVID that probably is not dissimilar from other viruses, like like long RSV is what we should call childhood asthma, right? Like there's some kids who get RSV at 18 months of age and they have asthma and a chronic inflammation of their lungs uh, with type two immune skewing and, and changes that are you know lasting for years and years and years and years uh, after the virus is gone. Uh, we don't call that long RSV, we call that childhood asthma or early childhood asthma. So there, there are lots of aspects the inflammation triggered by viruses um, that we already know and we already have ways of thinking about. And so I, I, I try to think about long COVID not so much as like this being some sort of like crazy mystery, but try to reduce it back to things that we already understand. Uh, and, and maybe that'll also give us some ideas about treatment, um, you know, in the lungs or, or in other areas. Well, I personally want to thank both of you the amount of time that you have spent preparing for tonight, the (laughs) ability to multitask tonight, uh, it's just been tremendous. We have had so many people here all the way to the bitter end and all the questions and, you know, there's more and I wish I could ask every one of them and I apologize, but 
you know, we, we <laughs> they're still coming in. Um, you know, we're here to help. We're here to help as much as we can. I encourage you, if you cannot find an answer and you want it, to send it to your Ask IDF on the website. We will try to get the answers for you. Continue to follow what, what IDF is putting out as we learn the information. We're trying to get it out to you in multiple formats. Um, but Dr. Butte and Dr. Sullivan, you guys have been amazing tonight. <laughs> Thank you for uh, hanging in there with me with the questions. And you know the prize goes to the stump, the doc. <laughs> I, I you, fit three <laughs> that, that was that one one. You <laughs> are gonna read about that tonight. <laughs> you are tremendous for volunteering your time and your brain cells and for all you do for your patients and for the whole PI community. And I truly cannot thank you enough. You are amazing. And to our community, keep in touch. We're trying, we're learning as you, and we're trying to get it out to you as fast as we figure it out. And unfortunately, some of it takes time and more research, but what we do know, we will gladly share with you. So reach out to us and we'll help you. And I will second that thank you, Colleen. Oh my goodness, the two of you are amazing. And we know how busy you are right now with your, your patients in the midst of COVID. And no doubt, um, we would have loved to have had you sit here with us all night. And we, know we could have. <laughs> you, we know that you would have totally done that. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And um, at this time, I would also like to thank each and every one of you, whether you joined us for five minutes or you joined us for all five hours. We are so glad you're here and anything, anytime, IDF is here for you on this journey. Take care and good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Stay healthy. Bye. <laughs>